And now, tonight's presentation of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Tonight, the story of a man who thought the only way to escape death was to search for it. We call it Diagnosis of Death. So now, starring Gene Bates with Lawrence Dobkin, here is tonight's suspense play, Diagnosis of Death. Come in, Martha, come in. Uh, I hope you don't mind my dropping in without an appointment. No, of course not. Uh... Sit down. Oh, thank you. Your nurse said Simon had already left. I suppose he'd call this snooping, but I think I have a right to know. Oh, Martha, I'm glad you dropped in. I tried to call you at home just a few minutes ago. Well, then it, it is serious? Well, right now I'm not speaking about Simon's health. Uh, a rather unfortunate thing has happened. Well, not an accident. In a sense... Now, I'm not even sure that anything is wrong. But if there is, I'm going to need your help. Well, of course, but what are you talking about? Let me start at the beginning. Simon had a one o'clock appointment here with me. I was to give him a final report on all the tests we've run on his condition. Yes, I know that. He wouldn't tell me much about it. I knew he was worried, of course, but he's such a hypochondriac. Yes, he was very worried. So was I. Oh, I didn't realize. Well, just over an hour ago, he arrived for that one o'clock appointment. Now, I happened to be upstairs in consultation with another doctor, and Simon was in the waiting room. Miss Herman says he was very nervous, naturally. Oh, yes, but... Well, he was there in the waiting room when I phoned down to ask Miss Herman to read me a lab report that had just come in. This was a report on another patient, not on Simon. Yes. And Miss Herman should have checked the door to the waiting room, but she thought it was closed. Evidently, it had swung open again. Simon must have heard everything she said over the telephone. But what... He heard her tell me that he was here for his appointment, and then immediately after he heard her read the report. And he would have no way of knowing that it wasn't his. He must have thought it was. But what are you... Well, I'll read you the last sentence of the diagnosis that he overheard. Oh, here. Yeah. The patient's condition is definitely malignant. In a stage too far advanced for successful surgery, fatal results are indicated in from one to three months. Oh, Jim. Then when Miss Herman finished and looked out, Simon was just leaving the waiting room. She called to him, but he wouldn't answer. He hasn't been back. Now, I've tried calling his office, your home, but no luck. Oh, poor Simon. He must be miserable. Poor dear, he's such a pessimist anyway, always ready to believe the worst. Now, if what I believe is true, he's... He's in an extremely emotional state right now, Martha. Oh, yes, it's just like him jumping to conclusions, getting all upset, when all he had to do was wait to see you. Well, his his report wasn't like that, was it? Oh, no, no, he's not seriously ill, nothing like that. Nothing can't be set right with a few weeks of treatment. Martha... Simon left here believing that he was going to die. A slow and pretty painful death. Well, we, we've got to tell him it was a mistake. Martha, I don't think you understand yet just, just how serious this might be. Well, what do you mean? You don't think... You don't think Simon would do anything like that? I think anybody faced with that situation might. I think we've got to find him, Arthur, as quickly as possible. Oh, hello, Mrs. Davis. Anne, is Mr. Davis in? Oh, no, I'm sorry. He left early today. Did he say where he was going or when he'd be back? Well, no, he said he wouldn't be back. He was leaving for the afternoon. Oh, Jim. How long ago did he leave? Oh, less than an hour, I think. Mm. He came back here after he left my office. <laughs> well, I was out for lunch. He was here when I came back. This is Dr. Kirk, Anne. Oh, yes, Doctor. Right. How long did he stay? Oh, maybe 15 or 20 minutes. Is, 
Is something wrong, Mrs. Davis? Why, we don't know yet, Anne. I hope not. You don't know where Mr. Davis might have gone? Did he have any business appointments? Well, one with Mr. Gaffney. But he told me to cancel that. Didn't say anything else? No. Did he seem upset? Well, I don't think so. A little preoccupied, perhaps. A little quieter than usual, but... Well, just what did he do while he was here? I don't know. He was alone in his office. Oh. May I look in there? It's just possible. Oh, of course, Doctor. This way. Thank you. Everything looks all right. What's this? Well, that's strange. It's addressed to me. Open it, please. It's, it's a check for $250. Oh, I don't understand. Well, there's a note, too. Would you read it, please? Miss Summers, thank you for your excellent services. I regret I will no longer need them. Enclosed is a check for one month's pay. You may finish out the week, and then you're free. Refer all of my clients to Benner and Brown, if you will, please. Sincerely, Simon Davis. Jim. Now, this may not mean what you think at all, Martha. He believed he was very ill. Naturally, he'd expect to give up his business. Let's us not jump to conclusions, oh, too. Please, God. Mrs. Davis, I don't understand. What's wrong? And Simon thought he was going to die. He may have decided to... Oh, no. Oh, Mrs. Davis, I'm sorry. Now, there may be no danger. But even if there isn't, we've got to find the man to relieve his mind. You can help, Miss Summers. Oh, yes, of course. If you get on the telephone, call yes. any place you can think of he might have gone. All right. If you find him, tell him he must talk to me, that what he thinks isn't true. He's not going to die. Jim, maybe we should call the police. Well, maybe. Actually, we don't know that he's planning anything. No, but maybe they can help us find him. Yes, I suppose you're right. Dr. Kirk. Yes? There is something I forgot to tell you. You asked if he did anything strange. Yes. Well, while he was in his office, he wrote a letter. What was strange about that? Well, it was in longhand. He didn't dictate it to me. Oh. And then he brought it out all addressed and stamped and asked me to mail it. Told me to take it right out and drop it down the chute by the elevator. Oh, was that unusual? No, but just before I dropped it down the chute, I... Well, I looked at the address. Well? It was addressed to you, Mrs. Davis. <laughs> You are listening to Diagnosis of Death, tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. The case of the jealous wife is a perfect example of how criminal gangs rise and fall. A series of supermarket holdups in Chicago went on unchecked, until a woman scorned helped local police turn the tables and nail the mob. Full details this Saturday night on CBS Radio's Gangbusters. Don't miss it over most of these same stations. The true case of the jealous wife on Gangbusters. And now we bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Gene Bates with Lawrence Dobkin, starring in tonight's production of Diagnosis of Death, a tale well calculated to keep you in... Suspense. Don't you see, Sergeant? Why would he write me a letter unless... unless he weren't coming home? You don't know what was in the letter, of course. No, no, it's already in the mail, but I know my husband. Of course, Mrs. Davis. Uh, he didn't tell his secretary anything? No, sir, nothing. Doctor, shall I go on calling? Oh, yes, yes, please, Miss Summers. All right. Sergeant, what else can we do? You're sure he's not at home? If he knew you were going to be out for no, the afternoon... No, he called there three times. There's no answer. Of course, he wouldn't answer if... Uh, we'll know about that soon enough. I sent a squad car to investigate at that address. Sergeant, do you think... You know your husband better than I do, ma'am. Yeah. Under the circumstances, you couldn't blame him too much. He hasn't had much time. It's only about three. He's had less than two hours. Usually people with ideas like this 
Well, it take a little while to think it over. Maybe have a few drinks. Time it doesn't drink. Well, but maybe under the circumstances... We'll or... try anything. Miss Summers, call any bars close around, will you? Oh, yes, Doctor, sure. Officer, can't we do something? Mrs. Davis, we're doing all we can. We've checked the emergency hospital. Every squad car in the area has been alerted. They're searching for a man of his description. We're checking bridges, railroad yards, tall buildings. We're checking the house. I know, but we just can't sit here. Maybe if we'd go out looking. Sergeant, maybe he's just walking down some street or sitting in the park. Just sitting yeah, I know how you feel, ma'am, but it's it's not very likely we'd find him unless we have some idea of where he might have gone. That's it exactly, Martha. Where would we go? Where would he go? I don't know. I don't know. I... If he were really decided on suicide, he'd have to go somewhere or get something to accomplish the purpose. Yeah, still, there are lots of ways. Just stepping out in front of a truck. Oh, no. uh, I'm sorry, Mrs. Davis. Martha, maybe you'd go into the inner office, huh? Lie down, rest a little while. No, I, I, I'm all right. I want to help. All right. Sergeant, uh, Mr. Davis isn't the kind of man for, uh, for the, the violent ways. Something more... You mean like poison? Sleeping pills? Yes, yes. That would be more likely. You have anything like that at home, Mrs. Davis? No, he never took sleeping pills. He never even wanted them in the house, even when he was in pain. Well, if he regarded them as too lethal to keep in the house, he might have thought of them. Uh, but he couldn't get them without a prescription. Well, maybe he could, where he was known. He might have tried. And if we could just pick up his trail someplace. Yeah. But where would he try? There's a drugstore right downstairs in this building. They must know him. All right, it's worth a chance. <laughs> Yes, of course I know Mr. Davis. He was in just a little while ago. What did he want? Well, as a matter of fact, he wanted some sleeping tablets. But he didn't have a prescription, so of course I couldn't supply him. As you know, I... You didn't sell him any? Well, I'm telling you, you know I couldn't. I was sorry to disappoint him. I told him to phone the doctor. That would be enough. And they could send the prescription over later. But he wouldn't stop the phone. He was in a hurry, and he, he said he'd be back. And I... Was well, anything wrong? No, but if you should come back, stall him and notify the police. Why, of course, officer. That's my car at the curb. I'm going to check in on the radio. All right, Sergeant. I'm afraid, Jim. I'm afraid. Martha, we don't know anything for sure. But we do know. Now we do know. He does intend to... Maybe not. Maybe not. He might have wanted the pills because of pain. He was having some pain. But he... Anyway, he didn't get them, Martha. And he's not likely to. But there are other things... Well, yes. But we're not sure yet. There's no use imagining things. We've got to keep calm, Martha, and just try to find him. Yes, yes, I, 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 I know. Thanks, Jim, for being here. I, I don't know what I've done oh, if... Oh, it was my fault. My office's fault. Mrs. Myself. Davis, was your car at home in the garage? Yes, Sergeant. Mr. Davis wasn't driving it then, huh? No, he always took the bus to work because of the parking problem. I do, too. We only use the car at night or on weekends. And finding it there doesn't mean anything. He's not at home, Mrs. Davis. They checked the house, talked to the neighbors. But inside? No, they're sure he hasn't been home this afternoon. Well, that leaves us right back where we started. Yeah. Does he own a gun? No, oh no. He's always been afraid of guns. Well, it's still a possibility. There are three pawn shops in this neighborhood. We might as well check them. I don't sell no guns to no guys without they got a permit. Now, you know that, Sergeant. I don't draw no beefs from you guys. Do I stay in business otherwise? Tell me that. Let me see the book. Sure, sure. Yeah, you take a look. Take a good look. I'm clean, you'll see. A good, clean book. Yeah, yeah. You wouldn't have put it in here anyway. 
I told you, I never sold no gun to no guy like you say. Look, Nico, this is no beef. This is different. This man wanted the gun to use on himself. We're trying to prevent that. We want your help. How can I help when I don't know nothing? Look, I, I know you've done it before, and you'll do it again, and someday we'll catch you at it. But this time, I don't care. Nothing happened. You understand? Yeah, yeah, you cops. I this told you. Mrs. Davis. We're trying to save her husband's life. Please, Mr. Nico. please. Just tell us the truth. Nothing happens, I promise you. Look, lady, I... How do you know I'm not telling the truth? Call it a hunch. Now, come on, level. Nothing happens? Nothing. Well, look. Now, understand, Sergeant, I don't never sell no guns to no guys without they got a permit, huh? But uh, this wasn't uh, really no guns, eh? You did sell him something. Well, yeah, a guy looks like you said, only it was kind of a, a special gun, You sold see? him a gun? Well, now, wait a minute, lady. That's what I'm trying to tell you. You got nothing to worry about. Go on. Because he ain't going to shoot nobody with that gun. Why not? Well, now look, Sarge. You said nothing happened. Yeah, yeah. I uh, don't usually do this kind of business, you understand, but uh, I kind of had a hunch what this bird was up to. That's why I'd done it. Honest. That's why I'd done it. What was wrong with the gun? Well, it didn't have no firing pin. This bird didn't know the difference. Of course, I didn't charge no real gun price, but uh, that gun won't shoot nobody. Honest. Okay, Nico. What do we do now, Sergeant? Well, we might as well cruise around a little. One thing, we're only a few minutes behind him now. Nicholas said he was in a little after three, about a half hour ago. Kind of gone far. All right. Mrs. Davis? Martha, get in. Don't you see, Jim? It means he really had decided. Yes, but he won't succeed, Martha. Not with that gun. No, but if he really wanted to... Simon. Martha, come on. We'll find him somehow. Yeah. Get in, Mrs. Davis. All right. Five L seven. Five L seven. Fourteen twenty three Vista. What time? Is Five eighty six E. Uh, twenty minutes to four. Six L ten. Six L ten. Nine sixteen West twenty first. I have a feeling report. we've got to find him quickly. I don't know why. Martha, just keep calm. There's no use torturing yourself by imagining things. One A fourteen. Jefferson Park, west side, Georgia Street entrance, man with the gun. Wait a minute. What? This is 1LY10. I'll take that call to Jefferson Park. 1LY10, Roger. 1A14, cancel your call to Jefferson Park. 1LY10 will handle. Jefferson Park? You think that... I don't know. We'll see. got to find that man and punish him, officer. It's a crying shame when men like that are allowed to run loose, giving guns to children. Everett, drop that thing. I told you not to touch it again. Here, let me have it, son. Yes, sir. Is it? Yeah. Oh. Son, where's the man who gave it to you? Well, he didn't exactly give it to me, mister. He dropped it in the trash can over there. But he didn't want it any more honest. It wasn't stealing. I know, son, but where's the man now? Well, he... He got on the bus over there at the corner. Going which way? Uh, that way. How long ago? Well, about ten minutes. Ten minutes. Oh, Simon. All right, come on, we'll get him. Mister? What, son? I know why he didn't want the gun. It don't work. Everett, you tried it. You tried to shoot it. You the wait bus. Your father it's our bus. He's taking the bus home. It also ends up out at the lake. The lake? We should be able to beat the bus there if we hurry. <laughs> Martha, Martha, it's going to be all right. We're going to get there in time. Jim, maybe it's my fault. Maybe if I'd been more interested, understood more. Maybe I'd been selfish. You must not blame yourself, Martha. But why at a time like this? Why wouldn't he come to me and share it with me? Maybe he wanted to spare you. Spare me? Jim, what time is it? 
Just four o'clock. No, it's two minutes after. Sergeant, will you turn right at Wabash Street, please? But Mrs. Davis... I want to stop at home first. We can't waste time. The bus will be at the lake it's any minute. It's only around the corner, half a block. I want to, Sergeant. But five minutes may make the difference, Mrs. Davis. Please, Sergeant, I have a feeling I want to go home. All right, Mrs. Davis. This is it. Yeah. The fourth house, the white one, with the picket fence. Mm-hmm. Everything looks peaceful enough. We'll go inside and look just to make sure. Hurry. Hurry. There's his coat. He's here. Huh? Simon! Mr. Davis? Simon! The bedroom this way. Simon! 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 Simon, where are you? How about the kitchen? Oh, uh, are there any other rooms? No. This coat. He was wearing that coat. And he wouldn't go out again without it. Not in this cold. Hey, wait. Where's the back door? That way. Oh, yes. Hurry. The garage. Motor is running. Come yeah. on. That's exhaust smoke. Come on. Yeah. Doc, work on him. There wasn't too much gas. He couldn't have been there long. Simon. Maybe I'd better get on the car radio. Doc, get the rescue squad. No. Don't think that'll be necessary, Sergeant. You don't mean he... he... Come here, Martha. Down here. Simon. Martha. I'm sorry. You're going to be all right. <laughs> Oh, Simon. Suspense in which Gene Bates, with Lawrence Dobkin, starred in Diagnosis of Death by John Dunkel. Next week, the story of a man who makes his escape from the most dreaded prison in the world. We call it The Man with the Steel Teeth. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Anthony Ellis. The music was composed by Lucian Marwick and conducted by Lud Gluskin. Featured in the cast were Jerry Hausner, Barney Phillips, Charlie Lung, Trudeau Marsden, Richard Beals, and Helen Cleave. Charles Boyer stars as Alphonse Bertillon, famous French detective who proved crime could be solved in the laboratory Sunday night on the Radio Hall of Fame. Bertillon proves the unidentifiable can be identified by revolutionary new means, or at least means revolutionary at the time. CBS Radio presents the Radio Hall of Fame, starring Charles Boyer, Sunday night on most of these stations. You enjoy City Hospital every Saturday in the daytime on the CBS Radio Network.